two squatters stole a veteran soldier's home. Then some angry bikers stormed the house and did something very shocking. Michael and his wife Danielle alighted from the plane hand in hand and beaming with smiles. They had just returned home to Florida from Hawaii, where Michael had served for the past two years. Home, they say, is where the heart is, and that was exactly the case with the couple. They just couldn't wait any longer to get home to their well-furnished and expansive bungalow. The duo had over the preceding years turned the once dilapidated house into a lovely dwelling place, with a well-maintained garden, apple orchard, fish pond, and even a small swimming pool surrounding the house. Michael and Danielle had also renovated the house according to their exquisite taste. The house was a dream house, where any nature-loving couple would love to retire. After the procedures at the airport, Michael, who was in his crisp full army uniform, soon flagged down a taxi. The couple boarded the taxi with their luggage en route to their house, both fully unaware that something truly shocking lay waiting for them. Once Michael and Danielle got down from the taxi with their luggage and headed to their house, both of them instinctively felt that something was off. Some of the windows that they had safely secured before they left the house for Hawaii were wide open. There were also foils of half-eaten meals, cans of sodas and beers, strewn around the house's entrance. Worse off, the whole house was lit up. The couple's worries grew as they approached the entrance door. With trembling hands, Michael got the key to the doors out of his pocket and slotted it into the door lock. With mounting anxiety, he turned the key in the lock repeatedly, desperately trying to open the door. However, despite his efforts, the door remained stubbornly closed. Danielle began to panic at once. Had someone tampered with the locks? She asked her husband. Calm down, darling. We just aren't sure of anything yet. Michael answered Danielle in a calm voice to reassure her as much as himself. Just then, a loud thud from inside the house answered Danielle's question. The couple stood rooted to a spot, looking really stunned. The doorknob rattled from the inside and the door creaked wide open. Two figures then emerged from the house and stared at the couple with hate-filled eyes. One of them was a tall and rough-looking man with a scaggly beard and hair. There was a faded tattoo of a skull on his bicep and he was holding a baseball bat. Beside the man stood a woman who was shorter in stock here, chewing gum loudly and blowing bubbles. What do you want, black man? The strange man barked at the couple in a venomous voice. Michael was able to recover from the initial shock just in time to growl at the man. What do we want in our own house? The man instantly burst into a sarcastic laugh and the woman standing next to him joined in the laughter. Michael and Danielle just stood there looking at the duo, with anger welling up inside Michael's heart. At long last, when he seemed to have had his fun with the laughter, the man screamed at the couple. This is our house now, soldier boy, and there's nothing on earth you can do about it. With that, the duo slammed the door shut with a terrific bang that sent shivers down Danielle's spine. Impossible, Michael angrily blurted out. This can't be happening, he continued. Daniel was speechless. She just kept staring at the door and at Michael while trying to recover from the shock. Michael had been in the army since he was 25. He saw action in Iraq and then in Afghanistan, where he received an Iron Cross medal for bravery and gallantry. After he had completed four tours of duties in Afghanistan, the military authorities shipped Michael back home to the United States. Danielle, whom Michael met and fell in love with in high school, was overjoyed that her beloved husband was finally back to her alive and whole. The lovebirds had just been married for a few months before Michael was sent to Iraq. Danielle just couldn't wait to make up all the lost time with the love of her life. Hence, when the military authorities posted Michael to Hawaii, she was more than willing to move there with him. Michael and Danielle packed up and left for Hawaii, where he served for two years. Upon their departure for Hawaii, the couple left their house in Florida empty and unoccupied. Unfortunately for the couple, this emptiness became a golden opportunity for the opportunistic squatters, Ortiz and his girlfriend Fatima, to steal their home. Utter anger and the sense of injustice pressed down heavily on Michael, as he stood there contemplating on the best course of action to take. After careful consideration, Michael decided to get the relevant authorities involved, so he dialed 911 and quickly explained the situation to the receiver on the other end of the line. When Michael was done calling the cops, he reached out to Danielle, pulled her into a warm embrace and kissed her forehead. Then he assured her the best way he could that everything would be fine. Danielle only nodded in affirmation to Michael's words of consolation. Barely 15 minutes later, two police officers from the sheriff's office pulled up in their patrol car, a sight that brought the couple a mix of relief and anxiety. 
the officers approached Michael with a sense of purpose. Their faces set in determined expressions. Michael explained the situation again, showing them the house deed and recounting the squatter's brazen occupation of his home. The officers listened attentively, their eyes flicking with concern as they took in the details. The cops started banging heavily on the door while announcing their presence in a loud voice. Soon enough, the door opened and Ortiz and Fatima stepped out staring surprisingly at the officers. The cops greeted the duo and asked to see the squatter's IDs. Ortiz and Fatima exchanged nervous glances, their eyes darting towards Michael before handing over their identifications. The officers spent a few minutes making calls and checking their tablets. By the time they were done, the squatters had concocted a surprising story, one that made Michael's eyes widen in disbelief. Ortiz claimed that he had an agreement with Lisa Pittis, a neighbor Michael knew and trusted, to stay in the house rent-free in exchange for repairs. Michael's mind raced as he tried to process this new information. His thoughts a jumbled mix of confusion and anger. The officers listened intently to Ortiz's claims. Michael's eyes narrowed, his mind racing with frustration. Yes, he knew Lisa Pettis, a kind and reliable neighbor who had always kept an eye on his property. He had asked her to recommend the handyman for some renovation work, but he had never authorized her to allow squatters to move in. The thought of it was absurd. Ortiz's words were laced with a sense of entitlement as if he believed he had a legitimate claim to Michael's home. The officer's voice brought Michael back to the present, his words a gentle but firm reminder that the situation was complex. The lead deputy explained Florida's squatter's rights law. He told Michael that the case was now a civil matter, not a criminal one. Sadly, the cops couldn't ask the squatters to leave. The only way for Michael to reclaim his house was by taking the squatters to court. Afterward, the cops wished the couple good luck and promptly took their leave. Michael and Daniel just couldn't believe what they had just heard. That Ortiz and Fatima could potentially claim ownership of their home, simply because they had occupied it for a certain period. The thought was outrageous, a violation of everything he believed about justice and property rights. Michael felt a sense of helplessness wash over him, a feeling he hadn't experienced all his life. He was a soldier, trained to fight and defend his beloved motherland. But this battle was different. This was a fight against a system that seemed stacked against them. Ortiz's smug expression had his eyes gleaming with a sense of triumph, only adding fuel to Michael's anger. Michael just couldn't stand the sight of the two squatters any longer, so he took Daniel by the arm and they walked away from the house to a nearby motel, both looking really downcasted. At the motel, Michael just couldn't sleep that night. He kept tossing in bed, thinking about the issue. Michael knew fully well that he couldn't just sit back and let the squatters take over his home, not after everything he and Daniel had done to make the house the marvelous place that it was. He needed a plan, a way to fight back and reclaim what was rightfully his. But what plan would successfully work out for him, Michael thought. Michael's mind raced with the daunting prospect of a legal battle. He couldn't fathom how the system could be so skewed against him. He had always been a law-abiding citizen, paying his taxes and mortgages on time and yet he was being forced to fight for what was rightfully his. The thought of pouring his hard-earned money into lawyer fees was suffocating. Every dollar he spent on legal battles was a dollar taken away from his family's well-being, and for what? To evict criminals who had no business being in his home in the first place. As he delved into the squatter's backgrounds, Michael's outrage grew. Ortiz had a long list of serious crimes on his record. While Fatima had a history of multiple drug-related arrests and convictions, making her a habitual offender. How could the system possibly side with them? It was a travesty of justice, a slap in the face to everything Michael held dear. The weight of the situation crushed him. He felt like he was drowning in a sea of legal jargon and bureaucratic red tape. Every phone call to his lawyer, every letter from the court and every conversation with the police only added to his frustration. He began to question the very fabric of society. Was this what it meant to be a homeowner in America? Was this the thanks he got for working hard and playing by the rules? As the days rolled by, Michael's anxiety mounted. He barely slept and barely ate. Danielle tried everything possible to be supportive, but even she couldn't understand the depth of his despair. As time flew by, Michael and Danielle were getting increasingly frustrated and hopeless about their situation. Little did they know that help was just around the corner, in the form of a group of unlikely allies who would change the course of this battle forever. A local newspaper had picked up Michael's story and it had sparked outrage and disbelief in the community. 
a group of army veterans and Viking enthusiasts who called themselves the Iron Eagles had heard about the couple's struggle and were eager to help. The group was a brotherhood of bikers, bound together by their military service and the shared sense of purpose. They had helped other veterans in need before, but there was something about Michael's story that resonated deeply with them. Maybe it was the injustice of it all, or maybe it was the fact that Michael was a fellow soldier, but they knew they had to act. They started making plans to help Michael and Daniel reclaim their home, and their approach was unconventional to say the least. The Iron Eagles arrived at the small motel where Michael and Daniel were staying. The couple was taken aback by the sight of the bikers, their black leather vests, black bandanas on mostly balding heads, strange tattoos and funny-looking mustaches that were reminiscent of the Victorian era made them look really tough. Hanks, the biker's leader with a handlebar mustache, dismounted from his bike and approached Michael, who had stepped out to meet them. Hanks firmly shook hands with Michael before he told him, We're here to help you get your home back, brother. His voice was low and firm. Michael was puzzled by the biker's bold move. However, he had no choice but to accept their offer of help. Together, they devised a plan to force Ortiz and Fatima out of the couple's house. A plan that was surely a shocking one. Three days after the bikers met with Michael, dozens of members of the Iron Eagle stormed the couple's former house in the late afternoon. Their motorcycles revved loudly as they prepared to teach the stubborn squatters a lesson. Michael was with them. His heart raced with anticipation and a hint of fear, but he knew he had to see this through. Hank gave a signal and the showdown began in earnest. All the bikers started honking their horns in unison. Some bikers circled the house while at it. Another set of bikers assigned to the task brought out various musical instruments and began playing their group's music and anthems back to back. Others got to the entrance door and started banging on it like their whole lives depended on pulling the door down. Soon enough, Ortiz and Fatima hurriedly emerged from inside the house and stood by the doorway, both looking stunned and terrified at the sight of the menacing and angry-looking bikers. The bikers completely ignored them and continued their scare tactics. Ortiz and Fatima exchanged nervous glasses and their eyes darted between the bikers and the house. They seemed to be calculating their move, but the bikers' intimidating presence left them frozen in a spot like two statues. The bikers' music was deafening, a thunderous mix of drums and guitars that seemed to shake the very foundations of the house. Michael felt his heart pounding in his chest, his senses overwhelmed by the sheer spectacle before him. He couldn't help but feel a sense of pride and gratitude towards the bikers, who had taken it upon themselves to defend his home against the unwanted squatters. As the hours ticked by, the standoff continued. The bikers showed no signs of relenting, their determination to reclaim Michael's home evident in their unwavering resolve. The neighborhood, once a quiet and peaceful enclave, was now a hub of activity. People emerged from their homes, drawn by the commotion and the blaring music. Some watched in awe, others with concern etched on their faces, but the bikers remained steadfast. Their message was as clear as daylight. This home belongs to Michael and Daniel, and it must be returned to the rightful owners. Else, they would never back down. As the sun began to set, the bikers showed no sign of fatigue. Their music continued to blast their flags waving defiantly in the breeze. It was a display of strength, unity, and unwavering commitment to a cause. At long last, after almost two hours of the showdown, Hanks gave a signal to the bikers and the whole noise died down at once. Then turning to Ortiz and Fatima, who both stood by the doorway looking as terrified as ever, he barked in a venom-filled voice, You two better leave on time before we return tomorrow. With that, Hanks gave another signal to his men, and they all left the scene just the same way they had arrived. Early the following day, the bikers made good on their threats and arrived at the house. Michael was with them like the previous day. Lo and behold, the bikers met the house empty and as silent as a graveyard. There was no sign of any living being inside the house. Ortiz and Fatima had fled out of fear. Michael was overwhelmed with happiness. He promptly called his wife on the phone and informed her of the good news. Daniel was beside herself with joy too. Afterward, Michael went around profusely thanking and shaking the bikers' hands, one after the other, starting with Hanks. The Iron Eagles had done what the cops couldn't do. They had returned his beloved home to him and his wife. Michael watched as the bikers disappeared into the distance, the sound of their engines fading into the quiet of the neighborhood. He took a deep breath, feeling a sense of peace wash over him. He walked back to his house, feeling a sense of closure and satisfaction. Michael returned to the motel that night to the warm embrace of Daniel. The couple had a little celebration on their way to celebrate their victory. They decided to hire a professional home cleaning firm to meticulously clean the house, as Ortiz and his girlfriend weren't the neatest people around to say the least. 
A week later, Michael and Daniel moved back into their beloved house, all thanks to the bikers' efforts. Michael soon joined the Iron Eagles group as a show of his gratitude to them. The members wholeheartedly welcomed Michael into their group. Michael and Daniel lived happily ever after in their beloved home. So what do you think about what the bikers did? Feel free to share your thoughts in the comment section. Thanks for watching and please don't hesitate to subscribe to our amazing channel for more captivating videos like this one. See you in the next video.